Well, good evening. Good, well, sorry. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Come on in the room. <laughs> We'd love to have a conversation with you. It's lunchtime for a few people, and I wanted to come on right around lunchtime just to have a bit of a, of a conversation or a discussion with something that I believe, one, we're not going to be able to, to accomplish in this one moment or this one sitting. Um, definitely not going to be able to exhaust it, but I believe that we should begin a conversation that should have a continuation going on and happening well after this Facebook Live. And so one of the things that I uh, truly believe that we should do is talk about um, an elephant that's in the room. <laughs> the proverbial elephant that's in a proverbial room. If you could do me a favor, though, and if you're coming on, share this video. And when you share it, let me know that you've shared it by by uh, doing hashtag share. Uh, that tells me that you're sharing it. Hashtag share uh, lets me know that you're partnering with me to spread the word, uh, especially uh, share it or tag a pastor uh, or a leader a bishop, uh, any, anyone of that nature, who may be leading in any capacity as it relates to ministry, because I really want to have a very candid, relevant, uh, real conversation uh, about leadership. One of the things that I attempt to teach as best I can is uh, leadership. We're called uh, by, by some the relevant leadership strategists, and I attempt to to do my best, right, to uh, walk in that particular role. And so, yeah, I, I want to have a conversation. Thank you for sharing. Thank you, Pastor Pratt, for sharing. I appreciate that. Thank you, uh, Pastor Johnson, for sharing. Thank you, George, for sharing. I appreciate you all for doing that. And thank you, Janice, for sharing. Okay, so I'm going to have a couple of guests come on, and uh, we're going to just have a candid conversation uh, nothing planned. We, we didn't talk through any kind of notes. It's just kind of impromptu because uh, here again, I think that we should have a discussion as relates to the price of saying yes. I, I really believe that because of how the anointing works, the scripture teaches us in the book of Psalms that the anointing concealeth a matter. I mean, it literally says the anointing concealeth a matter. In other words, whenever the Lord anoints us, whenever the power of God falls upon us, it works and functions just like makeup does, just like uh, MAC does, just like mascara, uh, just just like it. You're welcome, Pastor Sellers. I, I appreciate you, sir. It works just like foundation, if you will. It it is uh, it has the ability to cover blemishes and to uh, make sure that you look picture perfect. It's, it's the best filter that can be used. Many of us use filters uh, such as, uh, you know, on Instagram, those kind of things, because we always want to put out our best picture. So we'll take 13,000 pics of the same poles with different angles so that we can make sure that we look well enough uh, f for presentation purposes. And so the anointing of God works just like that. It, it's the perfect filter. It, thank, you, thank you for sharing, Pastor Goings. Uh, Apostle Urquhart, uh, we got to talk, sir. We, I need to reach out to you. I uh, Forgive me for being busy. Love you. Appreciate you. Thank you for sharing. Uh, so so when, when the anointing is upon us, right, it functions as a, Wilson is there, great. I'm getting ready to bring you right on. Uh, it functions as a mascara. Yeah, if mascara, it covers things. And so it conceals a matter. Uh, and then those to whom are looking from the outside in, all he is what the anointing has covered. All they see is what uh, has taken place. That relates to God moving, God working, God functioning, God helping that particular pastor. 
And so then with the anointing concealing matters, literally says conceal the matter, then you can go on about your day thinking that that pastor is wonderful, that they're fine. Because they look like Superman and Superwoman on Sunday. They look like Superman and Superwoman on Bible studies. They look like today, and you never realize that the matters of their heart are concealed through the veil called the anointing. And those to whom that don't have good perception, you will continue to go on thinking everything is well and fine. And that pastor is suffering silently. And then we end up hearing and seeing that that they've taken their life or done some things that we tend to share and reshare on Facebook when they fall into what we call degradation not realizing that they were suffering the whole while while we were gaining and uh, benefiting from their anointing. And so I've asked uh, one or two people to come on. One is actually with me right now. This 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 man of God is a powerful man of God. And I think that he has a great perspective as it relates to the price of sin. And so Dr. Reverend Dr. The Bishop, uh, if you could, sir, uh, I, I, I don't know, just speak on the map. I told him it's kind of impromptu. We didn't plan anything. We just, we just decided to talk. Listen, Bishop, first Someone of all. Someone said the um, outside noise. I, I guess they're hearing a lot of your background. <laughs> um, I'll do my best to make those adjustments. Um, quick question, Bishop. Can you hear me clearly? I can hear you. I hear the background okay. as well. but I. Let me make a quick <laughs> Is, is that better? I'm, I'm actually in a restaurant and I want to. Is, is that better? I, no, I still I still hear that babe in the background. She uh she needs to be heard. You hear? Oh, he or she. <laughs> whatever the thing is, that they want to be heard. Okay, well listen, I would <laughs> I would do my best. I'm I'm in a public restaurant, but I wanted to make certain um that I uh gave time to this and first of all bishop you know i honor you as my friend uh, my brother and i affectionately call you my east coast bishop <laughs> um, we are so connected and i appreciate everything about you um, and your leadership um, so thank you for allowing me to be a part of this conversation um, what i want to say is uh, the bible records a time when samson who was the strongest man in the earth um, at that time he is in a situation where his strength is connected to a particular secret. That secret was uh, the length of his hair um, and the absence of it being cut along with him not touching anything dead, along with him not drinking any strong drink, and a few other stipulations. Well, he's having a conversation with uh, this woman by the name of Delilah, and he, she's pressing him to share the secret, right? Um, he lies. He says, well, if this happens, I'll lose my strength. He gets up the next day. He shakes himself. He still has strength. She says, you lied. He told her another fib. He gets up the next day, shook himself. He still has strength. Finally, she presses into him more. His hair is cut throughout the night. Watch this. He wakes up the next day. The spirit had withdrawn himself from him. His strength was extracted, but he still shook himself. And so one of the challenges is that you have to be able to maturely know, and I'm saying you as in me, as in us, um, everybody, pastors, laity, we've got to know that there are many leaders that are shaking themselves, but our strength is gone. One mm. of the greatest challenges or misconceptions of the anointing is that we are strengthened because people see the shake. Yes. Just yes. because there's a shake does not mean there is strength. And my fear is that we are pastoring a people who are mesmerized by the shake, but have no discernment to detect that there's no strength. He's shaking, but the strength is gone. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the reasons why we experience defeat in so many areas. Um, and maybe it's not suicidal um which is the end of life maybe it is suicidal as it relates to the end of hope or the death of uh, faith 
Um, and that's one of the reasons why pastors go on shopping uh, binges. That's one of the reasons why they um, end up going to alcoholism and they end up smoking uh, marijuana and they end up um, or sometimes seeking um, counsel or comfort from other women or other men if they're a woman in ministry. And here's what I think. That's the problem. Quickly, I highlight possible solutions. Number one, we have to be intentional about teaching honor to our people, to our people more than acceptance. We teach and we preach acceptance more than we teach and preach honor because we want them to accept the word we preach. We want them to accept the guest preacher that we bring in. We want them to accept the vision that we cast. We want them to accept, but we do not go to great lengths to teach honor because what we need is only going to birth through a process and a mindset of honor. That concern so, that we're so, looking from. Go ahead. So, so no, no. I mean, I, I want you to keep talking, but I, I don't want you to run through all of these too quick because because honor, I believe, and you know my heart, is one of the greatest um, missing elements, or at least dying elements, that's happening in Christendom. Uh, it, it, it seems as if we are being more tolerated than honored. It's almost as if it's a checklist. I'm going to church as a checklist, not going to church, one, because I honor God, two, because I honor who God has placed in my life to help lead me, and submitting to those people in those places. I feel like as honor is being sucked away, drained away from ministry, that the weight is uh, becoming even more heavy upon those to whom are walking in ministry. So the less there is honor, the less there is help and lifters to, to whom uh, ensure that that pastor lives longer and lives stronger. I, I really think that one point when we started having this conversation about honoring the creature more than the creator, we started a, uh, a ripple effect where, where they started sucking away the fact that we should honor the one to whom is sacrificing. We should honor the one to whom is preaching and teaching. Not to say that there are some to whom abused honor, but because people abuse a thing doesn't mean the principle is wrong. The principle is still right. Those to whom practice the principle in erroneous ways, now they're wrong. But it doesn't mean we stop doing the principle. We learn how to have better perception and understanding about where to place that principle upon and who to place that principle upon. And, and, and so I want you to talk a little bit more to that honor piece. Absolutely. Um, first of all, Bishop, in the highlight of said conversation centered around uh, people honoring the creature more than the creator, I think that we have to revisit this concept and recognize that to honor the creator is to honor the creature. All right. Yes. To honor my stuff is to honor me. If I give you my car and you drive recklessly, I mean, you are running through every pothole and you tear up my possession. You mistreat and mishandle what belongs to me. You are, in fact, mistreating and mishandling me. <laughs> yes. And so because God is invisible. You know, he is the all wise God. He's the maker of the man and all of that, but he's invisible. So the only way we can honor him is when we honor somebody. So that's the very first thing um, that to honor the creature is to honor the creator. I don't think it's an either or. Yes. I think it's a both and and it's simultaneously. Yes. It's concurrent. Yes. And um, here's what I think. Um, and now this may not go over too well, and I hope I don't get in trouble. Um, but I think that the, the absence of of the preaching of honor um because here's the thing honor is predicated and contingent upon standards okay yeah and so when you have le leaders and i don't know maybe this I, well whenever you have senior leaders who are who are functioning because god calls us in our own humanity he calls us with our own flaws and when you have senior leaders functioning with low self-esteem functioning with um feelings of inadequacy functioning um with uh the those types of um, internal issues um, and they are not rising to the standard they are willing to allow people to mistreat them and mishandle them and and merely tolerate them and so at yeah. some point there has to be an understanding where pastors and senior pastors realize and and I'm speaking for myself because I have an issue with that because sometimes and I'm just being vulnerable 
publicly, sometimes there are certain things that I don't demand from my people in fear of their perception of me being abusive. Oh, I don't want to look like their former pastor. Oh, I don't want to look like. And at some point, we're going to have to grow out of that and realize again. Even if someone abuses a standard, it does not cancel the principle. There are people who break the speed limit all the time, but they don't change the speed limit. The speed limit is still posted. It is still something that you must obey. So I think that we have to go back to intentionally teaching and preaching honor, even, and this is going to be brazen, but I was sharing with a group of leaders, and I told them, I said that my primary responsibility as a pastor is to feed the flock. And I have to teach my members that if I come see you at jail or if I come see you at the hospital or if I pay your light bill, all of that's extra. None of that's required. Yeah. See, people don't yes. know that. People interpret what we do as extra as yes. requirements so they yes. don't even know when to honor yes. because in their mindset, yes. they're like, oh, in fact, guess what? How I know I'm telling the truth is when we don't do the extra stuff, they get mad at us as if the extra stuff was required. <laughs> Right. So they're no, mad you're, because you're, we didn't come visit them at the hospital. They're mad because we not, didn't answer their call. I don't have to return your text message. My job is to feed you. Right. Right. You're not being brazen at all, uh, uh, Wilson, at, at all. I, I mean, I, I teach that as well, and I preach that, although I still do my best to do the extra stuff. That's simply because of, of heart, love, ability, uh, availability and those kind of things. Not saying that we, sh not saying that is not to be done. Because I, I, because I know exactly what you're saying. We're not saying that it, it should not be done. We're saying that if it is done, it is not the requirement of that pastor to do it. And so then we're placing many a place um, uh, uh, expectations on senior leadership that God never did. And some of us have accepted those expectations to prove to others that we are being a good pastor. And those accepted expectations are literally destroying and killing us because we're trying to rate, rise up to a standard and an expectation that God never intended. He said, if you love me, feed my sheep. He didn't say, if you love me, go visit them at the hospital. He said, if you love me, feed my sheep. He didn't say, if you love me, return their text messages. So if you are teaching the unadulterated word of God, you are being a phenomenal pastor. Now, if you're going to visit, send text messages and all these kind of things, you're being a phenomenal pastor that's doing some extra things because you have the availability to do it, not because you are better than anyone else and in that regard because I was looking at a, a statistic and it said 70% of actually report having their vacation and personal time interrupted due to ministry expectations. And I kept thinking about, well, what ministry expectation now, 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 I, it's my vulnerable moment. I'm guilty. I do it all the time. And if I'm away on vacation, I'm still available for the people. I'm still texting, still checking in. I'm still calling. I'm still doing all those kind of things just because it's become kind of ingrained in me. I, I, I try to pour my life out, but not realizing that I should have an opportunity to have those moments, those moments as well, without, without feeling like if I don't do it, the people are going to think that I'm not loving them, or I'm not good, or, or, or I'm not being a great pastor. And that's not the case at all. You, you, you follow what I'm saying? And so then we're trying to run a race that was never ours to run. We're, we're trying to keep up a pace that was never our pace to walk. We're trying to lift up a weight that was never our weight at all. So the scripture teaches us to lay aside every weight and sin, right? And so then that weight to which we're lifting doesn't belong to us. And so then with all of the other responsibilities of being a pastor, such as of making sure that we are rightly dividing the word of truth. And many of us can't rightly divide the word of truth because we're right to divide folks from killing one another. We're, we're trying to rightly divide uh, or judgments between who said what and when they did what. Instead of really digging into the word and what the Lord is saying in a for a people, we're preaching messages about squabbles in a church because we don't have the time to, to, to invest ourselves into what we're supposed to be doing, number one, and not all those extra things. Again, not saying that those things are not important because they should be done.
absolutely. And again, uh, you said it best. And and not only not only and just to add to what you said, I believe more specifically, we allow the people to set and and then we do it vice versa. So I'm going to help some senior pastors that are listening or watching live or replay. We allow the people to set biological expectations on spiritual entities. We are set for a spiritual purpose as a pastor, but people have biological expectations, you know, and then we develop these biological expectations in return because, and you and I have had this conversation before, and I say it often because we pastor people with our own heart. Now, again, this may be crass, this may be brazen, but I'm trying to help at least 25 pastors, whether you're watching now or watching by replay, God never, if you show me in the scripture, I'll eat the pages written on. He has never required that we pastor people with our own heart. He said through the prophet Jeremiah, he said, I will give you <laughs> pastors after my heart. Okay, cool. So maybe you don't yeah. like Jeremiah. Okay, maybe you don't like Jeremiah, so let's talk about David. We honor David because he was a man after God's own heart. Okay, he was a man after God. So the problem is we are giving people our heart. How do I know? That's why when they leave, we are heartbroken. And how do I know that we have biological expectations on spiritual entities? Is because typically when somebody leaves us, we mention all the natural stuff first. I paid their light bill and they left me. I bailed them out of jail and they left me, <laughs> you know, we start, we, you know, I, I kept their marriage out of divorce court. See, we have been giving them our heart and it may be difficult, but number one, you got to make people earn access to your heart. Bishop Brown has heard me say this several times. And I want to say to some of y'all who are watching, even some of your children, the way you raise them in church, you're calling people who are temporary uncles and uncles, uh, uncles and aunties. And, and, and then, so now your children grow up in dysfunction because they see an uncle or they see an auntie, right, who leaves the church as soon as you rebuke them. And then when they leave the church, they leave their lives. So your children grow up with a temporary identification of that which is supposed to be permanent. At some point, we've got to recreate the lines of demarcation so that people recognize that my role in your life is to be a spiritual authority. I'm on assignment from God. My heart belongs to my wife, my heart belongs to my children God's heart belongs in my body to the people I will love you with God's heart so when you leave me you break God's heart I'm gonna go and pray for you. <laughs> you, you you know Pastor Wilson here's another transparent moment uh, another trans then I'm gonna let you go because because I know that you you agreed to just hop on and, and I don't want to hold you tie you down real long but but I've been very guilty of that as well I, I mean I've watched people leave and my heart was broken because I gave them my heart and uh, probably tried to, I gave them my heart and God's heart and every other heart I could find to give at that moment. And, and, and my children, now that my daughter is a little older, she's having conversations with me that's hard because I'm now having to explain to her the difference between, you know, them calling them auntie or uncle uh, and uh, even sister or brother, you know, that's my that's my little sister kind of deal. And then they're gone, and she's trying to figure out, well, if if they're supposed to be sister brother and love me, then then why did they leave me? And and and, and they're having it. She's literally having a few issues with that now. Some of the things that happened and started talking, and I'll try not to even cry now. I, I literally almost scream because I made that mistake not understanding that those expectations were not mine and definitely weren't supposed to be on my children. But I'm learning how, how to kind of pull that back and not to say that I don't love people because I do. It's a part of who I am. I'm, I'm, I'm a lover of people. You think of me, I don't get that from They also said that I was uh, uh, stuck on myself. I don't know where they get that from either, that I was some kind of whatever. <laughs> But, but that's not me at all. I don't think highly of myself, and I should, but I don't. So, you don't give yourself enough so, credit. Well, yeah, yeah amen. <laughs> amen. Amen. But um, I, it doesn't mean that, that I won't love them, because I'm trying to learn how 
to love them yet and still through, through God's heart, but having enough of connection to them that I'm still concerned and want them to succeed and all those kind of things. It's just a difficult place and it's hard to kind of walk through it and figure it out, especially when you don't have a road map, especially when you grew up and that's all you saw. And so now we're stepping into these roles uh, of fathering without having what we would call a good balance of a father, not knocking any of our, our other spiritual fathers and none of those things, because I believe some of them loved hard and hurt hard, but they suffered in silence because people were enamored by the shape. And so were we. I mean, you said it best. And so the shape did, did, not, did not present the struggle. And so they struggled in silence at their home while, while they were shaken in public. And, and we thought that was right. That's what we're supposed to do. And many of us have gotten years into this thing. And that was kind of hard to pull ourselves out of it because of, because of how we kind of built the structure. But I think with these recent um, uh, uh, places where we're seeing pastors committing suicide and leaving here, having nothing to do with the struggle that we sometimes think the struggle is. Because uh, in this recent one, and certainly not to try to politicize it at all, this, this, from what we saw from the outside looking in, they had every member that you could find. I, I'm thinking all the money had to be good. They had all the latest technology. They were on all platforms. I mean, they had everything that you would think would be great. And yet and still, there was an internal struggle that was never touched because of not having someone to whom to, to, to be a blueprint to walk out how to handle heart issues, as well as having somebody to talk to and to lean on that can understand and have an ear to hear them. Because it's hard to say I'm hurting when you got to be everybody's hero. Uh, whoa. Whoa. <laughs> it's, 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 it's hard to say that I'm hurting. Mm. When, and, and I'm trying to say that without crying as well. Jesus. When you have to be everybody's hero. You, you know, how does Superman say I'm weak? When, when, I, when, I, when I saw the, the Justice League, the very first one, and Superman died, I know it was just a movie, but I was in shock because I thought Superman never dies. I mean, he, he never dies. how in the world? Could the hero die? How in the world could the one to whom was imper impervious, who was indestructible, now be destroyed? And that thing started shaking me because, because heroes die if we don't protect them, if we don't look out for them, and if we don't help them look out for one another. Because Batman saw the kryptonite, but Superman didn't listen to to the one on the side saying, don't rush in there by yourself. You got help. You got encouragement. So, so, so brother, last point, then I'll let you go. Talk to that part about having the, 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 the falling victim to try to live up to, to optics that, that, may, that may not be the answer to the internal struggle that we have. Well, here's what I think. Um, and of course, you know, I don't have all the answers. I don't have a lot of the answers. But what I think is, and I see a lot of people uh, have posted on social media and, and even on here today, some people I know and, and they're saying, you know, pastors need encouragement and that's true. Pastors need a shoulder and that's true. Um, but more than that, pastors need an opportunity. You see, if we, if we talk about our hurt on a Sunday morning, they say that we're bleeding on the people. If we talk about our hurt in a private session, they say that we're bashing the people. So either way, either we're accused of bleeding or bashing. What we really need is an opportunity because if we can't bleed and that be okay, and if we can't bash and that be okay, <laughs> Guess who gets the pain? We go home, we talk about it to our wives, we talk about it to our children. So we bleed on our children and our wives. We bash our children and our wives. And again, having me having another vulnerable moment, I can't count the times when my wife has been sitting there looking at me like, what have I done to you? Because I was blaming the wrong bride. Because the church is the bride of Christ. Now I'm getting ready. See, now I'm trying to fight back tears. I was blank. Lord help us. 
Oh, Listen, Lord, I was sir. blaming oh, Lord, the Lord. wrong bride because, so I'm fussing at her. Well, you could have done that. Well, why didn't you do this? But you could have stopped that when really my frustration was toward the deacon that I had in place who didn't do it or the elder I had in place who didn't step up or the missionary that I had in place who didn't do what I asked him to do, but I was bleeding Woo. and bashing the Woo. wrong bride. All right. All right. You got to stop. You got to stop. Just, just stop. Just, just stop. So this, 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 stop. this woman that we are met, even, even when you deal with the bishopric, even when you deal with the bishopric, um, and, and someone asked me, you know, we were just talking about the episcopacy and someone asked, somebody said, you know, you don't seem like you're running toward the episcopacy, but I see you doing the work. And I said, well, yeah, you know, whatever. Right. And so they said, well, well, what's your biggest fear? Why are you running? I said, I don't know if I can handle two wives. And one of the reasons why the bishop wears his bishop ring on his right hand on the fourth finger is because though you are married to your wife and it's symbolized by the ring on your left ring finger, you are married to the church and it's symbolized yes. by the ring on your right fourth finger. And so the challenge yes. is that most pastors bleed on the wrong bride. We are upset with Ecclesia, but we are taking it out on our first lady, taking it out on our families. And guess what? Sometimes it's not violent. Sometimes it's subtle. Sometimes we got to take extra long vacations because we need a peace of mind from the church. But our home experiences the absence. Sometimes we've got to, sometimes we want to go out of town to preach because that you, and, and let me say the last thing, and I promise I'll let you go in case there's another guest. And I, listen, the Lord had to convict me. I was in a service. Oh, God, help me. Mm. Now, I'm really trying to fight back tears. I was in a service sir, a couple years sir. ago. And I was preaching and Bishop and I was preaching hard and I refused to let the people go. And every time the spirit died down and, you know, I've been doing this almost 20 years, you know what I'm saying? So I yes. learned the art of exaltation, yes. the art of preaching, yes. the, you know, the art of identifying the portals in the atmosphere. I know which door to go through. If y'all want to worship, yes. I know which door to get y'all through. If y'all want to dance, yes. Bishop, I would not let those people go. Okay. And. And somebody snapped the picture when I was in. I mean, you can see the passion on my face. I'm pouring down sweat, veins popping out of my neck. And the Lord said, you subconsciously dislike your reality and you wanted to keep the people in church because that creates a euphoric ambience of absence for you. And I was so broken because when I looked at that picture, I said, that is so peaceful for me preaching hard we in praise i said we might as well build three tabernacles like peter james and john said you know we, we might as well just hang out here all day long yes and yes, i wanted yes. to stay in church all day long all night because in my heart i was hurting and i didn't want to go home i, I didn't realize it i, I didn't want to go face the bills i didn't want to go face it because in my mind although that's my responsibility it was extra stuff because i had already taken on the responsibility of another man's bride but pastors i want to encourage you as i go Except the Lord build the house. Those of hey. us who labor, we are. Excuse me. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh Listen, but except I'm the Lord my. build the I'm house. My. Yes, Lord. We yeah. who are labor are laboring in vain. It is okay. Because the church will be okay. And, and we mm -hmm. fall in love, Bishop, with the church so much because we've got a huge heart. We want to see people successful. We want them to come out of debt. We don't want them to get a divorce. We want to see depression broken off of them. We want, But we can't want it more than they want it for themselves. Or for them we will drown yeah. trying to save somebody who didn't want a lifesaver. I think I better go. Thank you, Bishop, Wilson. for allowing me to come on. <laughs> Wilson, Wilson, Wilson. Sir, thank you yes, for Lord. those transparent moments. You're not by yourself, number one. I've, I've done it and still do it to this day and find myself having to pull back and thinking I, I'm using it as a drug and not as deliverance. It, it, it's, 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 it's my drug. It's how I, it's how I deal with it. And so I've stopped, I've stopped with mad dog. I've stopped with, uh, I've stopped with the drinking, right? And I moved from drinking alcohol to drinking anointing. <laughs> I've gone from indulging in alcohol to indulging in atmosphere and anointing. And it, it just, it kind of, it, it's the opiate that numbs the pain of one feeling like I've not been successful, feeling like I've not accomplished anything and not knowing how to say help because I'm somebody's hero and I don't want to disappoint them. 
because if I say I can't make it, then maybe maybe they won't make it, and then I'll be responsible for them falling when it's not my responsibility at all. It's God's responsibility. It's just my job to point the way to how to get out the pool, not to always jump in the pool when I'm when I can't swim well at that point myself. But I can definitely extend the fit. I can, I can extend the rod or I can point a direction. So that's the way to the steps. If I jump in here right now, then then we're all gonna drop. Thank you, sir. I uh absolutely thank you. this this helps me. I mean and I believe this conversation that needs to continue to, to happen more often than not. Uh, one of the greatest conversations I say often should be that of leadership. So that uh, so that we're not caught up in in anything. All right, man. I'm uh, I do have another guest that, that, that that's going to come on. I'm going to try to shut this down. Because, because this is good. I love you, sir, and I appreciate you. We'll be talking yes, to you soon. Yes, sir. I love you too, Bishop. God bless. Yes, sir. Well, guys, I, uh, Jesus Christ, um, Pastor Watson, if you're still on, I want to, I want to bring you on. That was so good. <laughs> Listen, that was so good. There is a price to this. Yes. There is a price to this. Yes. And, uh, Ladies and gentlemen, everyone to whom have said yes to the Lord, especially those to whom are in senior leadership, here's something that I've also learned along the way, that when I was an associate, when I was assistant, uh, when I was youth pastor, quote unquote, I thought that, you know, okay, I can handle this. I'm, I, I get it. I'm, I'm in it. I, I see it. It's able to be, I can kind of carry it. And I thought I had the answers and, uh, I had none of them. <laughs> I had I had none of them. Uh, let me see if I can bring you on, uh, Pastor. Do me a favor and send a request. Uh, it won't let me just click you to to bring you on. But if you request to come on, I can I can click you in. I thought I had every answer needed to uh, to be a senior leader until I started becoming a senior leader. And then I realized I had nothing prepared much to, to withstand the weight, whether it is a perceived weight or weight that, that, that I conjured up in my own mind. I had no clue of, of the weight that it was going to be walking as a senior leader and definitely did not understand the weight that was coming being a leader of leaders, walking in the bishopric. As Wilson said a few moments ago, you know, you're handling two brides, three if you include your actual, your actual bride. And uh, so, yeah, yeah, and then there's that. So let's see if we can't get Pastor Watson on here. Um, Stand by, guys. We uh, I'm working on getting. Oh, here we go. Okay, I think I got it. So, so I'm 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 awaiting Pastor Watson to click in and uh, to join in the conversation. We won't be much longer. I'm going to probably end this in about 20, 30 more minutes. Uh, 20, probably to be exact. But if this is blessing you, do me a favor, uh, share it. Uh, and then when you share it, hashtag share. God bless you, Terry Graham. I didn't get a chance to speak to many people that are coming on. I'm a, I'm a senior pastor, and God gave a yes, and I lost my 11-year-old. Oh, my. My, my, my. We're praying for you, uh, majors. Wow. Wow, that's that's tough. Uh, information that needs to go worldwide. Amen, George. I agree with that. Pastor Durant, God bless you, woman of God. She said, extremely helpful. Extremely helpful. Uh, man, I know y'all talking about pastors, but this is so universal. Amen. Amen, Johnson. It, it is universal. It, it is universal. Uh, let's see who else we got. Um, Aaron McNair, the apostle. 
Harry McNair uh, was uh, giving high five to Pastor Wilson. Yeah, Pastor Wilson is a blessing. All right. So, Pastor Mark, I've sent, thank you for sharing, Pastor Rand. God bless you, Pastor Jenkins. Uh, don't see the request. Okay, I sent it. It didn't, uh, it says sent. On my end, it says sent. So maybe you can send a request to come on and we can see if we can't get you that way. Uh, Yeah, on my end it says it says I sent it on my end. Pastor Johnson, Massachusetts. <laughs> I, I appreciate you. I appreciate you. Thank you. I uh we we're, we're trying to do our best. All right. Uh so while we're trying to work out the kinks with Pastor Mark Watson, let let me just continue to talk. Uh Pastors, I want you to be encouraged. One of the one of the points that we talked about a little earlier was the uh, was the weight of optics that sometimes what we see by way of Facebook live and pics and pictures and even what we see if we go into certain ministries we 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 may not understand how that one has such a weight that we may not be built for and or number two that uh, it may not be what it seems and uh, there are pressures that that pastors are under across the world that uh, are universal then there's some that are just unique to their to their world and their perspective now again i know that we're talking about pastors but this is not just a pastor's deal this is elders this is ministers this is deacons these are praise and worship leaders these are artists uh yeah there we go got you these are artists and things like that. So, so it's not just pastor. It's pastor plus uh, others to whom are suffering. And so then it's hard living up to something and uh, having, having them place in front of us expectations and standards that, are, that, that have never been God's, number one. And uh, we, we're, we're under those pressures. Okay, it says it's adding you, Pastor Mark, so we'll see if you if you can come on. Have him click the green and white icon beside his comment box. All right, it says it's adding you, sir. So we shall see. All right, one other point while we're waiting to add him in. Watch this now. Um, here, here's another statistic that, that just kind of blew my mind. Uh, here we go. It said, uh, 28% of pastors feel guilty for taking personal time off and not telling the church. 28% of pastors report uh, feeling guilty for having personal time off and not telling the church. 35% uh, of pastors uh, report the demands of the church deny them from spending time with their family. This stuff is real, ladies and gentlemen. It's not just something that we're kind of coming up with. And uh, yeah, I, I, Lord, Bishop L. Spencer Smith is, is, is on live. And sir, if you stick around, I'd love for you to come on and 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 speak some truth to this particular issue in in the only way that Elspeth Smith can. I have Pastor Mark Watson, Charlotte, uh, North Carolina, the Link Church is uh on on here, sir. And you and I kind of started a conversation earlier today about this uh epidemic it feels like and seems like called uh pastoral uh, suicide. Um, what, what's in your heart as it relates to this this issue in this moment? Well, Bishop, um, I just want to say thank you so much for having me on. And as you said, we started this conversation this morning. And I think as a result of what we've witnessed over this weekend um, with the tragic passing of Pastor Drew, it just, you know, 
is, is highlighting um, even more some of the issues that we know are there as pastors. And, and I feel like as a young pastor, um, one of the things that we have to grapple with and contend with internally is success and what our definition of success is. I, I think as pastors and leaders, even if you're a business um, woman or man, you're, you're trying to be successful. And what defines your success? Are you successful if you have 100 members? Are you successful if you have 200 members? What is your benchmark? And from the pictures that we've gleaned from uh, Pastor Drew's church, it looked highly successful. I think some of us would look at that and say, wow, I wish I could have that. Um, who, who is determining your value and your worth? And, and I think it is very troublesome for the pastor to measure their value and their worth off of the acclaim and the applause of the people. I mean, if we are, if we are allowing the people's applause and acclaim mm. to be the benchmark for our value, then we're going to lose every time. Mm. Um, because a lot of us, we preach a message on Sunday, let's say, and, and the members come up to us and say, it's a great word, Pastor. I'm so blessed by your word. No matter how many members come up to us and say that, if we don't believe that internally, that we've done a good job and we fulfilled what God wanted us to do, you'll still go home depressed. You will still go home and lose every single time. So we've got to know what environment we're playing ball in, what environment we're actually doing ministry in. Um, if you look at basketball, right? I used to play basketball in high school and we went hard to win a championship. Now, if we were to measure our championship um, off of an NBA championship, mm -hmm. we would minimize and diminish our championship every single time. You've got to mm -hmm. know you're playing high school basketball, you're not playing college basketball, you're not playing NBA basketball. And when you win on your level, you've got to know you have been successful. Mm -hmm. and, and with this social media culture, every Sunday as we go through our news feeds and we watch other people's services and we watch how many people got baptized, how many people got saved, if we don't have what we think they have gotten, then, then it hits us hard. It just, just to be transparent, Bishop, it, it really hits us hard. And I think that is one of the, the difficult things in our culture is that we're trying to measure our success, our value off of somebody else's platform. And, and it doesn't work. It doesn't we're work. Try, we're trying to measure our success and our value off of someone else's platform. My God, Pastor Mark. Yes, sir. And so, and so success becomes relative then. Yeah. And, and 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 in its relativity, uh, in, in its relativity, we need to determine where and or what success looks like for us, so that we're not trying to run after a lion that that doesn't belong to us, or right. in scripture terms, running after a giant that, that we can't defeat. Because I'm yeah. thinking about the fact that if what if some of the brothers to whom watched David go handle Goliath. Uh, and look and look at his success with that particular giant, and then assume that because they their kin as as it relates to brother or blood, thinking that they can go handle a giant as well, and then they go run and literally die because that was not their plat platform of success. Right, that they were successful enough being a part of the army. Yeah. All, all the army ran. I, I mean, at least they put up a stand so that so that so that the giant didn't uh, progress. I mm -hmm. mean, it may have stayed in spots, but it stayed in a spot. It didn't move further on the right. army. Now, now they they looked at what they did as a failure. But now that I'm thinking back through this, maybe it wasn't so much of a failure. I know the way we read it, saying that they ran from him kind of paints a picture of failure. But but maybe it wasn't so much failure as as it, if we look at it in the sense that the giant never advanced either. So although right. it kept spouting out its accusations against the army of the Lord, it never advanced on the army of the Lord as well. <laughs> and so right. then that what was painted as a failure was actually a success. 
And so my part was not to take him down. My part was to stop his progress. And if I celebrate that, then, then there's fulfillment that I receive as it relates to accomplishing what God called me to accomplish. And then let the Davids go handle cutting off heads because my part was only stopping his progress. That's so good, Bishop. That's so good because we all play different roles. And maybe your job is just to hold back Goliath until David comes. And, and the problem is, is that um, when David kills Goliath, Saul is jealous, right? We all know that story. Saul is jealous. But maybe if Saul looked at it as a victory for everybody, then Saul would have seen the battle as a win for the kingdom, as a win for us all and praise David instead of being jealous of David. And I feel like we can all gravitate to a Saul spirit because we feel like we're all supposed to kill Goliath. And maybe it's the kingdom that's supposed to kill Goliath. Mm. And, and we were supposed to be there to, to back David up and to cheer him on. I, I think Joseph is, is, a, is a real good example too, Bishop, because Joseph is successful in every season of his life. If you chart the life of Joseph, when he goes into Potiphar's house, he is successful in Potiphar's house. He is so successful that the favor of God rests on him in Potiphar's house. And Potiphar makes him head over all of his house. Now, if Joseph were to squander that opportunity and see that Potiphar's house is not really where he wants to be, and he starts imagining what it would be like to be in Pharaoh's palace, then he will miss the opportunity of being successful in Potiphar's house. And there are stages to this bishop. There are seasons to this bishop. And we cannot squander the opportunity in Potiphar's house because we're looking forward to, to Pharaoh's palace. I, I, mean, I mean, Joseph was so good with this because in every season, even when he's in the prison, Mm. Joseph is successful because he's over all the prisoners. And mm. Joseph was never looking forward to the next big thing. He was trusting God in every season and allowing God to raise him up where he was. And I feel like social media is causing us to feel like we've got to be in Pharaoh's palace tomorrow. We've got to be there tomorrow. And we're missing the favor of God right there in Potiphar's house, right there in the prison, because because there's seasons to this thing. There's seasons yes, to this sir. thing. So I, I think I think that being a young guy with this social media culture, there's oftentimes, Bishop, to be transparent, I come home from a Sunday, and I'm feeling away. I'm just, I'm feeling like it was a great Sunday, but I'm feeling away. And the more that I scroll through my news feed, the more that I go on Instagram, it just makes me feel even more sad. And, I, and I'm wondering, why am I sad? Why, why Haven't I accomplished what God wanted me to accomplish? There are times where we need to just take a moment and spend time with our kids. There's times where we just need to put down the phone and say, you know what? Today's not a good day. I'm not healthy enough to keep scrolling. I'm not healthy enough to go on somebody else's ministry and see all the thousands of people that came to their altar today and the mm. few people that came to mine. And, 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 and you just need to take time to find other outlets, to find other spaces to remain healthy and say, listen, I'm going to spend time with my kids today because they think I'm the greatest guy in the world. They think I'm the, I'm the world's best dad. They love me. They run on me. They jump on me. And, and I can hardly do any wrong. That's a safe place for me. Bishop, you were talking uh, with Pastor Wilson about Superman. And, and when you were talking about that, I, with the thought that came to me was that the people um, that are in Superman's world only see Superman. They never see Clark Kent because they see Clark Kent as a different person than Superman. But yeah. we as the viewers that watch the movie or read the comics, we see both. Mm. We see Clark Kent and Superman. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a very healthy thing in this season, in this culture, to show your congregation Superman and Clark Kent.
it's unhealthy because you cannot meet those expectations. You are both Superman and you are Clark Kent. And Amen. that's the only way you can, you can be vulnerable. That's the only way you can make mistakes and not kill yourself for it because you're both. You're not one, you're both. Pastor Mark, and, and, I, and I'm gonna let you go as well. Again, I don't wanna strap you down and tie you guys down. I, I, I did, I, I tied Wilson down long and I meant to. Uh, yeah. Uh, but but sure. let, let me tell you, one of the things that I remember hearing growing up was uh, to never let them see you sweat. You know, yep. they, they drilled that in our head, never let them see you sweat. And I, so then this Superman complex became prevalent in the pulpit. And so they told you, you're never supposed to let Clark Kent out. You leave right. Clark Kent in the office. But, yeah. but you stand on the platform, you let them see the Superman. Uh, or, or, or for you females, you leave, you leave Diana in the, yeah. in the office and you bring Wonder Woman to the platform. Right. And, and now you're doing all these spinning and tricks and knocking your braces together. Your enemies are falling down. You're blowing your breath. I mean, all those things. Uh, lazy, and people are watching this champion uh, do those things for God while the the alter ego or the actual real person the real person right they're suffering in silence and then we we many times don't realize that it's too late until it's too late yeah <laughs> because they told us you got to be tough you got to show the, the 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 tough man the the tough woman you you can't let them know that that something hurts you and 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 I tell you, sir, I struggle with that. I, I struggle with letting my church know whenever I'm a little disappointed or hurt. I, right. And, and and this is not to make it a culture of that, but I do believe some showing some of that can can be healthy both for the pastor and for the congregation. Yeah. Uh, any 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 other thought that you would like to say I right just, before we let you yeah. go? Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna go. I just want to say that as you were saying that, I realized that. If Superman dies, so does Clark Kent. Mm. And your family needs Clark Kent. <laughs> they don't need Superman. And if Superman dies while you're on that stage, Clark Kent is gone too. And, and, and what is your family going to do? What are your friends going to do if Clark Kent is gone? Because that's who they really love. They don't yeah. need the cape. They need, they need the Clark Kent. So thank you so much, Bishop for having me on. I know yeah. you got other people you want to bring in. I appreciate the conversation. It's a, it's a necessary one. Sir, thank you for coming on. And, and we're going to continue this conversation. It won't end now. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. All right. So like, wow, <laughs> that just, just wow. All of that, just wow. Um, great conversation. A conversation that needs to continue to happen. A conversation that, that needs to continue to go on. I have now, in my estimation, <laughs> one of the greatest voices of our generation that I'm glad that's finally deciding to open up his mouth <laughs> and speak, and people are going to gather. I'm, I'm one of the ones. <laughs> and so uh, to know that he's on live, one, is a blessing to me. And, and sir, I'd love for you, I don't know how long you've been listening, uh, but I'd love <laughs> for you to speak truth to some of the things that we've said and correct us. If, oh, if no. you're wrong in anything that we've said or anything that I've said. Well, I can't say correct the other two. Let me speak to me. You, you, <laughs> Whatever, you're welcome man. to correct me because we submit to your bishopric. Whatever. Your... Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Could, could you well, speak a little bit? First of all, a hearty Monday, Monday afternoon. What's up? Um, <laughs> um, I'm grateful, my brother, to be even um, uh honored to be a part of this uh this facebook live and then definitely talk what a tremendous tragedy um what a tremendous um yeah just i i mean it but it but it so speaks to i think the times in which we live in terms of being trying to be a leader and trying to measure balance uh, uh effort with success and all of the things that um um pastor was just saying are, are so poignant to to the to the matter at hand um, last night I did a I did a Facebook live and I didn't even know that he had passed away. I knew that um, he had tried to take his pastor tried to take his life, but I didn't know that um, he uh, he, lo uh, he lost his, lost his life. Um, but what what I what I was doing was talking about the keys to humanity, mm. and one of the things, Bishop, 
that that they don't teach us in the college is is how to how to understand humanity as a divine tool or divine uh, divine device that connects mm. us to God. When what we when we do what we do, humanity our humanity is oftentimes overlooked. We are placed in these positions, and no one ever does a psychological or emotional examination of of people who are in power. Um, it's coming to front now, coming to bear. But 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 nobody checked out Saul's emotional stability when he be, mm. when he was you know anointed king. You know why? Because all they wanted was a king. That's all they wanted. That's the scripture. All they wanted. Even the prophet told them that's not what you want. The Lord told them that ain't what you want. But the people wanted a king. The people wanted a king. They didn't understand that Saul. If you understand when Saul is found. The Bible says he is found in tremendous insecurity. He is hiding among the stuff, even though he is head and shoulders above the rest. Historians uh, 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 describe Saul as a very beautiful, handsome man. But in, mm -hmm. internally, internally, there are things that we can uh, we see in the scripture that are going on emotionally and mentally um, with Saul. And yet he is demanded to be the king. He is the selection to be the king. And so when we see that, that's how it even is till, till now. We talk a lot about emotional and mental health, but as long as the people have a king, and I don't, I don't and I, listen to me, I don't definitely blame the people for desiring leadership and right. desiring successful leadership. I don't, right. I don't, but I do think that if, if they don't know how to handle the humanity of leadership, and yes. whenever you re and whenever you reject my humanity and force me to to mobilize in divinity, you here's what I said last night. Whenever I do that, you cause me to have to have a false feeling based upon a real feeling. Right. You have to I, I, I then then get in a position to where I have to have a false feeling from a real feeling. And because people don't understand that we really feel then we are we have to hide and we have to maneuver around the pain the disgust the feelings of both success and victory because victory yes. comes with pressure that comes yes. because now now if you win one time you got to win again you know yes. if you got one big conference that was packed out guess what you got to have another conference if you got folks a thousand people to come next week everybody is looking for a thousand and one Right. Yes. Because Paul Saul is never happy about killing his thousands. He is always happy about them cheering about David's ten thousands. So the, mm -hmm. the last pastor was absolutely right. But nobody nobody really cares about the humanity of leadership because mm. we become the higher we go, the more we become the standard in the minds of mm. people. And, and mm -hmm. so and so when, when when you take away my humanity and that my humanity is a is also a divine intention of God. My humanity right. is what the what is the vehicle for my divinity. And so, right. if you take me being able to take care of my humanity and just leave me to my divinity, I want to say this again: you force me, you force me to have a false feeling based upon a real feeling, and I don't know what to do with my feelings. I don't know what to do with. The fact that I feel insecure, even though I got all of the trophies on my in my cabinet, I feel insecure. And and we've got to talk to not just leaders about being transparent, but we got to also talk about the people who are led by leaders when when their transparency is revealed. Your, your leader needs a vacation, but if, listen, and here's the truth of the matter: not, like no other, no other occupation, the pastor has to think about. When I go on vacation with my family, are the folks going to come? Right. Because I be, got to think about finances. Because, right. And, and let's just tell the truth. A lot of people are raggedy. Yes. Okay. You, you yes. shouldn't have brought me on here. It's Monday and I'm unfiltered. A lot of, the, a lot of folks are raggedy. They are, they are idol driven. They are personality driven. And a lot of ministries are built on that same idol. A yes. lot of them. A lot of them. A lot of them. It's toxic. It's a toxic relationship between pulpit and pews that I believe that God is revealing that our, our mutual need for him. Why are we doing what we're doing? 
Is it to be loved by people? And if from, for the people, is it to have someone to, to always listen to me and always be there present, uh, being a part of the daycare center mentality that we have in church? Mm -hmm. Bishop, I, I refuse to die and leave my wife and children with insurance money and tears. I refuse to do that. No, I refuse to do that. No sure. church, no church, and I love the Impact Nation, but no church and no member means that much to me because you know what they're going to do? They're going to find somebody else to idolize, right? Yes, sir. But listen, they leave, they leave us, when, they leave when we're alive. So you know they're gonna leave when we dead. When we dead. So I mean, but Bishop, <laughs> Bishop, let me let me ask though, because see now yeah. now you you kind of grew up in the same era that I did, and so you know that that regime that taught us not yeah. to show our humanity. I Absolutely. mean, they, it was drilled in us to not show our humanity, to yeah. never let be a sweat, to to always point to victory. And, and any mentioning of breaks or hurts or whatever shows shows the people that you're not fit to lead. Okay, right. that was one era, and, and, and yeah. of course they, they ingrained that in us. Then when we started seeing some of them falling, leaders falling, we watched the people's response to that, or any leader that dared that dared to say Damn. I'm hurting. We watched how the people responded to that leader who said they were hurting and, and the mass exodus. And you, you're right, all the things that we have to think through as we stand up to keep the church rolling and going. So so with that being said, how, how do we walk, and, and I'm sure gingerly, number one, but how do we walk towards allowing for there to be those moments of humanity and keeping a balance so that we don't become whiners, but winners? Right. Well, I believe, listen, I believe in, in Jesus is our pattern in all things, who was fully human and fully divine. And what Jesus did when his humanity was worn down, he had no problem saying, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty. That was not an issue for him. But what Jesus did do was he had a, he had his, his humanity was so connected to God that he knew how, he knew how to bring his, his humanity back to to the one that gave him that form so that it could be replenished and filled. He knew when to draw himself away from the multitudes. He knew when to, to pull himself aside from, you know, with his inner circle. And I think inner circle is very, very important. I think it's in, inner circles. Um, if it had not been for inner circles, uh, an ability to text you and to text the other few other pastors, you know, the, on, on our level who understand the level of, of, of triumph and trauma yes. that we go through, then yes. it, but there, but for the grace of God, go I, you know, and, and you and I, but we have to, it, it, we have to make it seem all right. I lived in that kind of, I was raised by that kind of pastor. My, my granddaddy was that kind of person who went travel pastor for 50 years, pastor two churches, went to see everybody in the hospital you know, all that kind of stuff. And then when he was old and died, none, very, very few of those people showed up for him. And, and, and so you saw what was left was a shell of a man who died, not from the disease they say he had, he died and gave up fighting because of a broken heart. Because all of those years that he had poured into those people in his moment of humanity, in his moment where, where sickness attacked his humanity, that nobody showed up. And, and so mm. what, what I'm saying is we've got to dare, we've got to dare to understand that we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was at all points tempted such as we are yet without sin. Yes. So there is a balance, Bishop, number one, that Jesus shows us that we're going to be touched and the people need to know we are touched just like them. We get, we get tempted just like them. We get angry just like them. We get fed up just like them. We go off just like them, but without sin. That's the part that as leaders we have to master. Because, again, that's why I said my humanity is also a divine intent, not just my divinity, but my humanity has been fashioned by God to carry, to carry my divinity, to carry his will, his, my anoint, the anointing that he gives me, the gifting and all of that. And so we just got to change the narrative. And begin yes. to, to, to speak to people. And look, if, I, if, if one day, you know, 
and here's the dude. Here's the dude. You can have a thousand members, but if the right five leave, you had a bad day. And that's oh, the truth. That's yes, the sir. truth. You can have yes, five thousand members, but if the two who you were depending on leave you, it is like you lost the five thousand. And that mm -hmm. is what people need to understand. Folks like, well, they got a packed church. It don't matter. If you get betrayed by the right person, if those ten thousand people do not matter like that. Mm. That's just how it is. Because whoever I whoever I become naked with, if they leave me, I'm automatically they automatically take my heart and my secrets. Yes. I'm not revealing my humanity to five thousand people. But those five, those five that I did, that's why Jesus was asking, Y'all three can't tarry with me for one hour. For one hour. Falling asleep on my humanity. Yes. I, I expect everybody else to leave me, but not y'all. Yes. Right. Yes. And so, you know, it is very important, Bishop, that this this conversation goes along, because, again, I think we've got to begin to speak about not just divinity, sir, but healthy humanity. We as pastors have to tell people and show them, yes, that we are human. When we in that pulpit, and I heard you, man, when we in that pulpit, Superman comes out. But in yes, that sir. office, we got Clark Kent issues. These yes, sir. Parking issues that need to that we we probably need to not probably every pastor needs a therapist, a counselor, or somebody who they can talk to, an inner yeah. circle. You know, somebody who can say, you know what, I feel like blowing up all of this this joint and just leaving and go work at McDonald's, right? <laughs> but we all need we all need that, and yes. that's not weakness because if it was if it's weak for me, it's weak for Jesus. Right, right, and it's not weak for him. It is not. Bishop, yeah, we this 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 has to be a conversation. Absolutely. It has to be a conversation because we're losing too many talented, gifted voices who are not finished. Absolutely. And the unfinished work makes it more arduous for the next generation because now it means the next generation has to go back and pick up the unfinished as yeah. well as their part. And, and so that's an extra weight that that should not be done. And if we don't if we don't take a moment and speak to these voices, these gifted voices, these these poignant voices, these these potentially great voices and ones who are already great, then we're going to lose the value that God placed in them for us simply because they they they've snuffed out the light that the Lord placed in the earth and or someone burnt up the oil of that light way before their time because and, the and, oil and, was placed. Right, and Bishop, and, and I'm, I'm about to go eat lunch with my pretty wife. There goes. But here's the, deal. Okay. Here's, the, here's the deal. The truth of the matter is this. We all, and I, 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 we don't all weigh the same. Yeah. And I want people to, I want people to understand that. The call of God causes us to have a different kind of weight than somebody who is not called to do what we're called to do. And so when 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 the Bible says, touch not mine anointed and do my prophet no harm, and David's honor of an evil Saul who was out to get him, and David said, I will not kill him because that's the Lord's anointed. David understood weights. And not only did David understood stand weights, that Saul weighs more than me right now. He's mm. the king. He went, mm -hmm. And here's the deal. But he also sees his future. He says, mm, but I'm going to be the king. And if I kill a king, I get permission for me to be killed while I'm king. And so a lot of people speak against men and women of God in the pews, not understanding their future, not understanding that they're sowing seeds, even in our frailty, even in our humanity, even when we don't get it right, even when we're prideful and we're arrogant and we're angry and all those different kinds of things, you have to still be careful about how you speak against the Lord's weight. You've got to be careful because what will happen is that you will sow a seed against your own future. See, nobody was able to kill David, even when they were mad, because David didn't kill a king. See, so if you kill a king, when you become <laughs> a king, you get permission to kill the king. Amen. I want to say that to everybody that's looking on here that's like, well, they just like us. And we don't know. It, it ain't that we better. We're different. We got a different kind of weight on us. We got yes. two mortgages to worry about. We got yes. two sets of insurances to worry about. We got yes. two houses yeah. to think about, at least two houses to think about. There is a different weight. We don't just have, I just don't have the three of my, my wife and my three kids, my four kids 
to worry about. I got to worry about my members' kids. I've got to worry about their marriage. I got all of these different kinds of stuff. If I'm going to be a good pastor, if I'm going to be right. a good leader, we got to worry right. about it. So if I don't weigh the same as you, then then God may not judge me the same way as you because he knows what he put on me. He knows what he put on It's so easy to say what you would and would not do when ain't you and you've not been called to do it. You know, I've been saved all my life and I ain't never... To, to really help, don't laugh at me, help their humanity and, and really take your humanity back to God. I got to go eat lunch. Thank you so much, man. Um, give Lady You go eat lunch, brother. Bishop. We'll talk. I All love right, you man, much. Take care. Thank you. All right. Thank take you. care. You're welcome. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we've been on now for about an hour uh, and 15 minutes. Um, and it's a conversation that should continue to go on. I saw you, Lady Blue. It will be a conversation that's going to take place. So that's a perfect segue for me to add this, that in and then close. This September, the 5th through the 7th, we're hosting what is called a Servants Summit. Uh, and it'll be in Greenville, South Carolina, at the Love, at the Love Center, uh, Nicoltown Missionary Baptist Church. Uh, three days of uh, of processing and development, impartation, preachers, uh, teachers, uh, not just something for what you would call a church setting, but also to help uh, you develop in your what, what, what some call secular uh, positions. And Lady Blue asked, will we have a conversation such as this at the summit? Absolutely, we will. I believe that there's a, there's a platform or a uh, what we call a uh, panel discussion that's going to take place on Thursday, if I'm not mistaken. It's going to happen on Thursday right around 1 o'clock, if I'm not mistaken. All right, but you can go to the website and check out uh, that or click the link. Uh, we'll put the link in this box or in this uh, video so that you can just click that link and you can see the schedule and then make sure that you're there for the panel discussion that's going to take place uh, as it relates to some of what we, we spoke about to today, if not more. If you're watching this uh, by replay, share this video, uh, go back and listen to it. I promise you there was so much said. Uh, there were moments where we were fighting back tears. There were moments when we were celebrating. There were moments where we were all impacted and, and empowered because we have a heart for the leader, and there is a price that we pay for our yes. There's a price that we pay, but that price does not have to equal death too soon or death before time, that there's help for those to whom are walking in this level of weight that maybe they didn't quite understand how heavy uh, the weight was, and it, it became more devastating and um, uh, uh, more arduous than uh, they contemplated or they figured. And so it caused for them to fall falter. And as Bishop uh, Spence, uh, Bishop L. Spencer Smith just said, that uh, we ended up having to have false feelings for real feelings. False feelings, F-I-L-L-I-N-G-S, for false, for real feelings, F-E-E-L-I-N-G-S. Because we could not be able to show our divine humanity as much as the divinity that we walk in as it relates to God. So, so yeah, September the 5th through the 7th, Servants Summit, Greenville, South Carolina, conversations such as this is going to take place right there at Nicoltown Missionary Baptist Church. Lady Blue put the address there, 327 Ackley Street. Uh, we'll be there Wednesday, starting Wednesday evening, running uh, to Thursday, uh, with the pastor's brunch, then right back at Thursday evening, and then Friday all day. We're going to be pouring in and giving all that we can to make sure that uh, we equip and build those. Brian Bowie, bless you, sir, that we equip those to whom um, 
are, are going to come to this particular session. I uh, just want to close with that. Uh, we, we didn't do this for that particular reason, but it, ge it does give us an opportunity to let you know that there is help. So if you are a pastor and you're in the Greenville, South Carolina area, uh, do your best uh, to get to the Servant Summit Greenville, and I believe God has help for you within those sessions. I believe there will be a moment for strength for those to whom are suffering in silence. As Pastor Wilson said earlier, we know you got the shake, but the shake may not uh, give way to the silent struggle. You follow? All right. So don't suffer in silence. There's help, and you don't have to snuff out the light. There is an appointed time for us to leave here, but I believe that many are snuffing out the light before time, and we're missing an opportunity to, to gather what God placed in those vessels to better our lives. Pastor, bishops, those who are walking in senior leadership, you are important. Your bank account may not show it. The membership may not reflect it. Uh, what you see around you may not look like it, but what you give Sunday after Sunday, what you do, Bible study after Bible study, what you do, phone call after phone call, return text after return text, is blessing somebody's life. And if you have an opportunity to help one person, that, my brother, that, my sister, that is success. If heaven celebrates off of one soul that's lost coming back. You should celebrate off of one soul that you've impacted by the ministry that the Lord has placed inside of you. This is Bishop R. Christopher Brown III, the relevant leadership strategist. And we're praying for you, and we have an ear if you need us at any point. And as we close, let me also say, starting next month, the very first Thursday in September, we want you to t tune in because we'll start our live broadcast on Dominion TV called a Brown Gravy Moment. We're so excited about that happening that you'll get a chance to witness and watch and receive from what the Lord has given unto us. It's called a Brown Gravy Moment. Tune in. And by the way, go to uh, our YouTube channel and follow or subscribe to that YouTube channel. Because if you miss the broadcast, it'll be uploaded on YouTube, and you can go back and watch it at any point and at any time. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching for this whole hour and now 45, almost 50 minutes, close to two hours. I pray it blessed you. I believe it did. If you're watching replay, share it. And when you share it, do hashtag share. I'm going to go back and try to read and respond to some of the comments that I didn't get a chance to while we were talking. I love you. I appreciate you. And may heaven smile upon you. God bless you, Pastor Rose. I got to reach out to you. Uh, I got some work I, I'm going to need some help with. <laughs> Hashtag Brown Gravy. God bless you, man. We love you. May heaven smile upon you.